Hey everyone, I want to make a video today talking about a big subject and that is big books. And I want to talk about this for a few reasons. Um, first off, and the main reason is because I'm about to start reading this big, huge mother quacker right here, which is Duck's Newburyport by Lucy Ellman. And you know, I, I want to read this because it is listed for the Booker Prize, but as I talked about in a couple of videos previous to the Booker Prize long list being announced for this year, um, I've been wanting to read this book anyway, so I'm glad that the prize is, you know, giving me this extra push to actually get and read this this novel because uh, you know we've, we've we have this issue sometimes as readers that there's a big novel we want to read but it creates all this anxiety for us because we know that when we start reading this it is going to consume our reading time for multiple weeks or even months um, so that we won't be able to read anything else and I know this is a huge just like really book nerd anxiety to, to have because of course other people who just read casually will say well if you want to read a book then just read it just start in reading it reading it and like what does it really matter but of course you know big book nerds uh, will have this big anxiety about it because we're made aware of all these other books that are being published and we'll inevitably have a huge TBR stack that we want to get to um, and know that this is going to consume so much of our time and booktube is littered with videos like this of people either reading a little lot Life or uh, The Luminaries by Eleanor Catton or uh, you know any other like big huge novel which will take them months and months to, to read and they're like well I'm still reading this book I'm still getting through it and you know and there's this slight resentment around it because uh, it is taking up so much of our time uh, but at the same time I think there are so many more delights to be had in a big huge book than there are in you know much slimmer books because quite often sometimes uh, we can finish reading a novel that's only you know 150 or 200 pages long and we're like oh but I want more I, I want I want to stay in this story and with these characters and you know big novels can give us the chance to do that because we'll uh, they take place over so many hundreds of pages. So I'm going to talk about this like issue in general, but also some big books that are on my shelf that I've been wanting to get to. And I'd like to know if there are any books that you have that are like this that have sat on your shelf for literally years waiting for you to get to them. But you know, just having that hesitancy and reluctance because uh, you, you don't know how much time it's going to take you to actually complete these books. And I want to give a few examples of books that I think really earn their their long length because they do something else in their subject matter you know that they they couldn't do in in a short amount of pages so I'm going to classify a big book as any novel or book that's over 500 pages long because I tend to think of the average length of a novel as maybe 200 or 250 pages and so sort of double that and like well that makes a really long book and uh, so uh, first off I want to talk about you know one of uh, what's commonly considered one of the greatest novels of all time and that's Crime and Punishment by Dostoevsky and I think this still does just remain one of my favorite novels of all time and it's one I want to reread but you know then there's the, the issue of you reread a really long novel and then you know it's taking you even more months of, of your time when you could be reading other books but I think this novel would really warrant it because you know it's about a, a small localized story which is essentially a moral dilemma of um, that someone who uh, decides to make a crime and uh, and then there are unintended consequences of that that crime when it's actually being committed and then it, it creates this bigger much bigger issue um, than it would would have been initially in the beginning and you know and Dostoevsky just has this way of writing taking this one small localized story and creating a whole expansive view of a big society all around it so it involves many other characters too and many other storylines um, that all get sort of wrapped up together and is just so gripping and really emotionally compelling all the way through so um, I, I was just completely gripped by this book and there's more Dostoevsky which I want to read and which I'll talk about um, in a minute so um, then 
the second example I want to talk about is Fall on Your Knees by Anne-Marie MacDonald, which is a long uh, sort of family epic novel because it takes place over multiple generations. And, you know, and this is something about big books, um, which I think can handle uh, multiple generations better than shorter novels generally. I'm sure there's some exceptions to this, but, but because you're able to really get into these characters' lives and, and see them as they develop over the course of their life and then their children as they develop over the course of their lives, uh, you, you get this much bigger look at sort of family stories and genetics and what's inherited and what's lost and what's talked about and what's not talked about over multiple generations. And so Fall on Your Knees is a really good example of this, how family secrets can be so ingrained over the course of multiple generations of things that just aren't talked about, but which are still felt in our presence in these families' lives. And, and you see this, how this manifests in the lives of two sisters, particularly in this novel. And, and uh, yeah, and I just, I just love this novel and I've been wanting to read more by this author as well. And then the third example I want to talk about, I think is a, a great big novel, is uh, Blonde by Joyce Carol Oates. Of course, we're going to talk about Joyce Carol Oates. And this is a really interesting case because I think, I, I haven't actually looked at all the page numbers of all of her novels, but I think this still stands as her longest novel that she's ever written. So um, this edition is, uh, I think, 735 pages long. And, uh, and what she does in this novel is so incredible because it, she does just deal with one person's life, that is Norma Jean Baker, who went on to become Marilyn Monroe, one of the biggest icons of the 20th century and one of it, the most tragic icons as well. And she presents her story, creatively imagines her life in this way that we we see her from her humble beginnings um, as, as an orphan, someone who didn't really have anyone to turn to in her life and had to become completely self-reliant and in a way kind of completely invent herself and who she was and how she becomes lost in this whole sense of blondness, this, this whole sense of how do you sell yourself in America? How do you make people love you? And she becomes so addicted to this in a way that she be completely loses herself within the process. And it's this is a really interesting case because when Joyce Carol Oates started writing this novel, she was just gonna write it as a novella, as um, just the very beginning of Norma Jean's life, showing her development. And then when she takes on the name Marilyn Monroe, um, she was gonna end the novella, but then she decided to carry on and show um, the, how her life changed and how her personality changed over the years and uh, and yeah her her real struggle with her her craft how she wanted to be a really great actress but of course how she looked and how the persona she took on um, she wasn't really allowed to nurture her talent as the way as as she as she really should have um, and especially because her um, natural personality was so introverted and shy, you know, which you wouldn't think um, looking at the image of Marilyn Monroe because this is such an extroverted personality that, you know, um, it's really um, just more like a, a drag act that she, she took on and a persona she took on in order to, um, you know, to, to be loved and, loved and embraced by the world. So yeah, I think this is a magnificent novel. And it's interesting because this, this novel was adapted for TV um, into a movie and it's still um, meant to be adapted into a movie again, a much more high profile movie with um, famous actresses and stuff. Um, but I think that's, that's really difficult to do with this novel because it's so much about her inner life. Like how do you put that on the screen without also just making it a sort of like a, a um, a sort of documentary about about Marilyn Monroe's life, um, and it's you know it's a challenging subject because this is such a sensational personality that is the object of a lot of conspiracy theories, and so a lot of people have a sort of puerile interest in Marilyn Monroe's life, whereas Joyce Carol Oates is really exploring her inner life and also how you know this sort of American phenomenon of how people can become lost in this whole bigger image of themselves. And so, yeah, obviously this is one of my favorite novels of all time as well. So yeah, I have this whole 
whole other pile of novels that I've been meaning to get to. Uh, most recently, this other novel by Alice Jolly called Mary Ann Sait Imbecile. It's a historical novel published earlier this year, um, and which is really long, over uh, well, yeah, 620 pages or so, but gets into the personality of this, uh, this woman, this um, ordinary housemaid in, I think, the, the late 19th century. Uh, and then there is a novel called A Fraction of the Whole by Stephen Toltz. This is a novel which has sat on my shelf for many, many years, ever since it was published. I got the hardback when it was published. And I've read another Steve Toltz novel that he published since this came out, which I really enjoyed. And so, um, so yeah, I've been wanting to, to get to this earlier novel of his, but it's, it's very long. Uh, and then there is Soul Mountain um, by Gao Queen Cheng, who won the Nobel Prize for Literature, and uh, and yeah, this is another really non-novel that I've been wanting to, to read and get to, because uh, yeah, never read this author's work, and um, and I don't think many people have, even though he's won the Nobel Prize, but um, but yeah, one that I'm quite keen to read. And then there is this uh, a um, recent translation of a Dostoevsky novel called The Adolescent, which is one of his lesser known novels about a young man who tries to uh, establish his place in the world. And, um, and yeah, I'm just sort of keen to read it because it's yeah, one of his lesser known novels. And, um, and so I'm sort of interested to see uh, what aspects of his writing are still there that I found so gripping in Crime and Punishment, but also, um, yeah, maybe why this isn't one of his, his best known novels. There's this novel called Stone Upon Stone, which is a Polish novel, which was highly, highly recommended by um, Camel from What Camel Reads, his booktube channel, which sadly isn't updated anymore. We don't see much of Camel anymore. He's still active on Instagram and stuff, but, uh, but yeah, I'm really sad he doesn't post videos so much anymore. But yeah, this is highly recommended novel by him, a Polish historical novel um, that I've been really wanting to get to, but, uh, but yeah, it's really long. And, uh, and then there's this novel, Barkskins, by E. Annie Prue. Um, and I've read Annie Prue's writing before and really enjoyed her work, but, um, but never got around to this novel, even though it was long listed for the Women's Prize a few years ago. But, um, but yeah, just it's one I just didn't get around to, but is a multi-generational historical epic um, going through like multiple centuries, I believe, in American life. And uh, yeah, so it's been one I've been really wanting to read. And then I want to briefly talk about uh, biographies because quite often biographies are really long because, um, you know, they have to fit in a whole life as well as, um, you know, the, the family histories of whatever personality they're talking about, but also the different interpretations of the significant works that um, they produced in their life. Biographies in particular, I'm interested in literary biographies of authors from the past. And so one I read recently that I really enjoyed and thought was completely worth it was Matthew Sturgis's recent biography of Oscar Wilde. And this clocks in at over almost uh, almost 900 pages, uh, but yeah, um, is great in how it shows his his life and work. And even though I thought I had this sort of understanding of Oscar Wilde's life, it gave me a really new perspective on him and his work and the development of his craft um, as well. And um, you know, biographies biographies are always great because you know they um, will inevitably include pictures of uh, the author's life and people around their life, and so um, you can see that in the book as well. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so other biographies I've been wanting to, literary biographies I've been wanting to read recently um, or for a long time is uh, this big biography of Christopher Isherwood uh, by Peter Parker. And uh, there's a biography of Christina Stead, who is a really interesting novelist that not many people talk about anymore. But, um, but that, yeah, this is a fa fairly extensive biography. And then there's a recent biography about Laura Ingalls Wilde. Um, called Prairie Fires, which is meant to be really good and I think was shortlisted for some prizes in America. Um, and uh, yeah, so I've been really wanting to read this as well. Uh, so, um, so yeah, those are some big books that I want to read. Let me know if you've read any of them, if you think they're worth it. Let me know some really long books that, that you've been wanting to read um, and that have been on your shelves for ages and you just haven't got around to. But also let me know other big books that um, you think you've read and you think really are worth it and really merit that big long investment that it takes to, to actually read them. Um, and also, yeah, let me know if you have any like strategies for going about reading this. Like um, I was 
talk about this with uh, Mark Nash in the comments of one of my videos recently where, you know, there's, do you, uh, do you just try to read that one book all the way through or do you try to fit in other books around and between reading that book? Because, you know, there's a sort of danger in that if, you, if you're reading other shorter books while also reading this much bigger book, it can make the reading of that much bigger book seem even you know twice as long as it normally would because you're stopping and reading all these other books in the same time and uh, and but you know at the same time if you just commit yourself to reading this one big book then you know it means you might not read anything else for a month or multiple months and you know like I said this big book nerd problem but uh, but you know it's one that we have and so I thought I would talk about so so I I am gonna read this and but I I think how I'm gonna, my strategy for going around reading it is I'll, in physical form, because um, it only exists in physical form, I'm just going to read this as a physical copy. But in between, you know, the times when I, I can't um, be reading a physical copy when I'm walking somewhere or if I'm on public transport going to work, to or from work, and it's so crowded I, I can't you know, lift my book up and, and hold it amongst a big crowd. Um, I think I'll be listening to audiobooks um, as well because I have some audiobooks lined up that I've been wanting to read. So, um, so yeah, so that's, that's sort of my strategy to, to go about reading this book. But, uh, but yeah, let me know if you're reading this, how you're getting along with it, and if you have a particular strategy for uh, going about reading it. So, uh, so yeah, I'll uh, speak to you again soon, and happy reading, everyone. Bye.